recording. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I was about to say good morning. <laughs> good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this presentation and on uh, improving title access for researchers, the USG Enhancement Project. And we have with us Shelly Rogers from University of West Georgia, which I believe the library there is at Ingram, the Ingram Library. She is a senior cataloger and a professor there. Thank you so much, Shelly, for joining us today for this presentation. Go ahead. Thank you, Joy. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon from a sunny, beautiful Carrollton, Georgia. I'm talking to you from my home where I didn't think to buy a webcam for my beautiful computer setup here to work during the pandemic. So I stuck a photo of myself here on the first slide and on the last slide. So those of you who don't know me can just get a mental picture. I really want to thank you for taking uh, your time to join me this afternoon. I appreciate that. I've been uh, the senior cataloger, as Joy mentioned, for almost 13 years now at the University of West Georgia. I'm a tenured full professor, and I've been a librarian for 32 years. <laughs> And my title today for this presentation is Improving Title Access for Our Researchers, the USG Enhancement Project. I could have said the USG Content Notes Enhancement Project. And I want to just give you a note about the why, why I use the word researchers here in the title. A colleague of mine mentioned that users or patrons is not so much the current terminology as researchers is coming to the fore. So I may still say users, I'm pretty old school, or patrons or scholars or researchers, but uh, it, you know what I mean, virtually anyone who's using the catalog as the tool to fulfill their information need. Here's an abstract or uh, a summary of what I hope to convey to you today. This is an overview of how the USG catalogers can implement the contents note enhancement project at their institutions. The project was approved by the USG cataloging committee in late 2019 to improve title and author access in Primo to resources which contain multiple titles. This project is important because after enhancement, Researchers can find these titles through a title or an author keyword search of the catalog, but not through the browse search functions. The resources that are being enhanced are based on a survey in 2019, where we found that short story collections needed to be prioritized first. And a shared Google Sheet spreadsheet was made available to the USG catalogers by the Gill staff. In 2020, the spreadsheet for poetry collections was shared. I personally began working on the project in late 2019 when it came out, and then the pandemic hit in mid-March. My priorities changed completely. The library was closed. I couldn't work on fiscal items. So in mid-March through early July, this became my number one priority, working at home electronically. So I got quite a bit done then. Uh, this year, I have started doing some work on the poetry collections, but not a whole lot yet, to tell you the truth. So the short story is really what I've learned the most from. I want to give you just a, a brief overview here by one screen. Here it is simply before and after. This is what the contents note looks like on OCLC before you enhance it. This is an unformatted contents note. After it's formatted, there's a second indicator of zero and there are subfield indicators, subfield T and subfield R particularly, T for the title, R for the statement of responsibility. It's important that the punctuation look like this and afterward, uh, the subfields will pop in like this. So just in one glance, you can see what this project is doing. And you can see why, if you think about it, this is important. When this is your contents note, Vampire of the Village will be retrieved by the patrons 
when they do a general keyword search, but it won't be up at the top of the, of the results. I can pretty well promise you that. They, they may find this on the fifth, the sixth screen after hundreds of results. But after the contents note is enhanced, Vampire of the Village will be one of the first results that they'll find if they did a title keyword search. And in my experience, even in a general keyword search of the catalog, it appears higher in the results list. But the fact that the title is indexed by the computer and the author increases the discoverability of these items to virtually everyone using the catalog. Now here's how to get started. First, you want to go to the Gill site and you're looking at the Alma training for cataloging the cataloging projects. You're going to click on the enhancing 505 fields and then there are four separate sections there. There's background information, there's general instructions, there's the spreadsheet of records for enhancement that you'll be working through, and there are instructions for installing the OCLC macro. I am not going to go over the background information and the general instructions. They are not long documents. They are very informative. You can read through those and get that information. But I do want to tell you, I don't think my presentation substitutes for reading that information. So please do read it before you personally start working on this project. For those of you who might not know, uh, what is a macro? I just mentioned the OCLC macro. Well, a macro is a sequence of keystrokes that can be programmed to help with repetitive tasks. You can assign the sequence to a function key on your keyboard. So you just press that key, the macro does its work, and the contents note is formatted. And I strongly recommend that you don't try to do this project without the macro. It is an incredibly time-saving tool, as you'll see. So when you've read those instructions, Install the macro, and the instructions, are, as I mentioned, are right at that Gill site. I personally am not very good at installing a macro. My colleague Miriam helped me out by sitting with me and installing this because I don't do it every day, right? I just use it every day. So if you are not particularly techy, uh, go ahead and ask a colleague who is. Hey, will you sit down with me and help me work through this? Chances are someone at your institution would be glad to help you. Then after the macro is installed on OCLC, you can begin by looking at the shared spreadsheet. Look for the titles your institution holds. Now here I'm showing you the short story collection spreadsheet. You notice it has gray fields that are done items. You don't worry about those. Uh, skip the red ones because a colleague is working on it and the yellow ones are not a priority. I will talk about that later. A shout out here to Simon Hunt, who pulled this data back in November, uh, and then it became available to work on right after that. So when you have this spreadsheet up, what you're going to do is look for your institution symbol, or at least that's what I did. I want to share with you what my workflow priorities were. I figured I should start first with the items that only my institution held. I didn't think those were likely to be worked on by anyone else. And I figured that helps my users the most right away. So my community first, because who knows how much time I would have to give to this. I certainly didn't know in 2019 that a pandemic was coming and I would be working on this all the time. So first I'd recommend you uh, look for the items that only your institution owns, then ones that your institution and another one owns and do those. And then finally, if you have the time, if you've worked through all those, work on the ones that your institution doesn't own. If you are a NACO participant and can do ones that you don't own but are required to have NACO capability, uh, that's super. So everything that you do is going to help patrons, but personally, I thought it was best to start with my community. And I ran that plan by my supervisor who did approve of that. 
Once you select a line where your institution's holdings are noted, change the fill color to red for that line or a block of lines. To be honest, I started with just one line by line and then I got tired of that. So I would just block out a whole like 10 or 12 in red. And to do that, here's the fill symbol, the fill color. It looks like a little beaker or a print cartridge with a drop of ink coming out of it. Click on that button and just change it to bright red. That tells others you're working on it so they don't mess around with it. And then of course, after it's done, this is what it looks like. The next thing you're going to do is copy the OCLC number. So on that line, go to the function line and copy the OCLC number. Then you're going to toggle over to OCLC connection and you're going to do a command line search. I always use an asterisk instead of the pound or number sign. And here's why. Here's a little tip. In order to use the number sign, you have to hit the shift key and reach over with your right hand and hit that pound sign. That's too much motion for me. On the right side of your keypad, hopefully you have a number pad and the asterisk is towards the upper right. I am used to just reaching over with my hand and hitting that asterisk key without even looking. So I only use one short keystroke instead of two. And I always try to do the least motion I can. Carpal tunnel is a consideration. And of course, time and effort. So use an asterisk key and then just paste in the number. The first thing I do when I look at an OCLC record is really, I like to look at the encoding level, whether it's a full level record, it's minimal level, or it's an abbreviated level. I also like to look at the O40 and kind of get an idea of the history of the record and what institutions used it. Uh, and that can make uh, some decisions for me on the quality of what I'm looking at based on that institution. Um, I will look the record over in general, just glance through it quickly, and then I make some decisions on how I'm going to proceed. But we're talking about the contents note enhancement. So here's an example of what a record might look like before the enhancement. You see it's not a formatted contents note, but this is the perfect punctuation that you must have. Okay, you have to have space, hyphen, hyphen, space between your titles. If you have a statement of responsibility, you have to have a space, forward slash, space. This helps the macro to parse out what it needs to look for and change. So once your punctuation looks like that, you can use the macro. I assigned it to my F5 key, so after any editing that I do, I simply hit the F5 key and check the results. And here's what it looks like after the enhancement. You can see the second indicator is zero and all these subfields are in here now. You certainly don't want to type these all in yourself by hand so you can see the importance of the macro. Now, when the contents note is already um, for uh, it's already enhanced, you can do the replace action using the menu if you like. Go up to action and choose replace and update holdings or you can use the hotkeys alternate plus F11. But be careful. Use that replace and update holdings only if your library owns it. If you're doing work for another institution's holdings, just replace the record. Or save keystrokes, which I'm all about, and time by adding the button to your toolbar. In this case, when I was done with my institution's holdings, I didn't want to just always automatically replace and update holdings, which is a button I'd have. But instead, I wanted to do just replace record. So I added that to my toolbar as sort of a signal to myself, oh, you don't want to add holdings to this. We don't own it. So this keeps me from doing that. An option that you have after that, but I strongly recommend, is that you export the record to Alma. 
I like to do that because if it fails to overlay due to a multi-match, the situation can be reported and resolved, which helps improve our union catalog even more. If you don't do the export, the overnight processes that Gill staff run will do it for you. But if you have that multi-match, that particular record won't export automatically. And here's an example of that failure because of the multi-matches found for the record. If you encounter this box of doom, please send an email to the LibAnswers email list at this address. All you have to do is say that a merge is needed and give the OCLC control number and the title. That's it. Uh, the UGA folks in particular, I found Kelly and Julie are marvelous at taking care of this like immediately. So they know how to do this very well. Just give them the control number and the title. After you've exported it, toggle back to the spreadsheet and change the fill color to gray to show that it's done. I like to use one of these medium grays, this one right here because I find the line is kind of dark and hard to read if I choose a darker gray. So go for a medium gray. It's very important that you change the line to gray so others know that it's done and they don't have to worry about it. And here it is after the gray color. As you know, as a cataloger, those basics are not always what you find, right? It can get more complicated. This will be something you will see commonly. You have punctuation to fix. When you see a contents note from an old bib record, you must correct the punctuation before using the macro. As I said before, and I wanna stress it, have that space hyphen hyphen space and always have a space forward slash space if you have a statement of responsibility then the macro will work. Here's another example of a record that needs editing. Before editing, it didn't have those spaces. After editing, I added the spaces that were needed. And then I applied the macro and it looks like this. Now let's take a closer look at the contents note because subfield G may come into play. As you know, if it's an enhanced contents note, it's the second indicator zero. You have these subfield T's for title, subfield R for the statement of responsibility, but you might also need a subfield G, which we haven't seen yet, but we will now. G is for miscellaneous information. It could be the date, it could be the volume number. It could be just about anything that doesn't fall into one of these two categories. But it's information you don't want to lose. So here's a contents note before the enhancement. You see it's German. There are three volumes. I didn't think this was very useful, obviously, in helping our patrons find individual titles. So I had the book pulled. I think I went and pulled the book at this point. I think it was 2019. And I had to key in the table of contents. Now, I want to digress just for a short moment to show you my toolbar on OCLC Connection. When you're doing German, it's certainly helpful, really any foreign language, uh, to have this ALA button on your toolbar. That allows you to enter diacritics and special characters. You're going to need the umlaut with German. So in this case, you see I have it highlighted. So say I had the letter O and I wanted to put an umlaut over it. I would be on the space right after the O. I would click on my button, then click on this, and then click insert and close. And it will insert the umlaut right over that O that I had just typed. I also want to show you a few other things about my toolbar. I took out all the junk I never use and I customized this with stuff that I use every day that I catalog. These four buttons are really wonderful. Although I'm a NACO participant now, I used these for years before I was a NACO participant. This is control all headings. This is control a single heading. This is uncontrol all headings. 
and this is uncontrol a single heading. Those are very useful. I have buttons for constant data. In fact, I usually have four. See these arrow keys? I know they're grayed out here, but they really help you with navigation, going forward and back in a group, going to the next list of 100 records or back, and going further than those. I use those all the time. And finally, this one, copy the OCLC control number. It looks like a little clipboard with a C number sign. Really helpful if you need to overlay a record in ALMA and the particular number for OCLC isn't in there, just copy it this way. When you come over here and copy it, maybe you won't copy the whole thing, but clicking on this button, you will. Uh, years ago when I started cataloging, uh, this didn't work very well to you know, click it. Sometimes it wouldn't click the whole thing. So I have a practice of clicking this button multiple times before I actually leave it just to be sure I have the correct current number um, uh, in memory. But anyway, to get back to our project here, ALA is what it's called. I always think it's American Library Association. It bears no resemblance whatever to diacritics, but that's what they call it here. Make sure you have that button on your toolbar. So here's the contents note that after I've added all these titles and enhanced it. So you can see the first volume, which I didn't think had a title that needed to be indexed separately. It's not distinctive enough, but I have all the other titles listed. Uh, I use subfield G for the dates as well as the volume numbers. Here we have the second volume, the third volume. Notice all the German um, letters, diacritics, so it's just wonderful to have that ALA button really handy. Here's something to be aware of. There are two flaws that I have found with the macro flaw, uh, with the macro. One inserts a subfield R instead of subfield G for those dates. So in this example, everything that you see with a G, it was an R after I used the macro, I had to go in manually and change each one from R to G. So this is why after you use the macro, you have to look at what you've got and you know really examine it. Is it what you want? The computer can't do everything exactly right in this case, as brilliant as Joel Hahn's macro is, uh, you do have to manually change the Gs. Here's another flaw. I don't think this one is, is time consuming or bad, if you will. There's a flaw where it adds DAT as a last field on the record. And you go, what? Well, when the 505 has a non-Latin script, as this one does, after using the macro, a final invalid DAT field will appear. This will cause an error message. Delete this field before replacing the record. That's all you have to do. But I did wonder, why does it do that? So I wrote to Walter Nickerson at the University of Rochester, and he told me back in early 2020 on, uh, via email, when the macro tries to read the field, the response is, data contains non-Latin script. Unfortunately, the macro considers that that character string is actually the 505 field to enhance. And after operating on it, tries to add it back to the record as a new field using the first three characters as the tag. And of course, DAT is a nonsensical field tag in Mark. The only solutions to the strange field being added are rewriting the macro so it can deal with non-Latin scripts, a solution I'm guessing Joel does not wish to provide, or removing all traces of the non-Latin script from the field before running the macro and then adding them back later. Um, I think it's a lot easier to simply delete that last field rather than trying to remove all this and add it back later. Uh, you can do what works for you, but I think that's an easy, easy fix. Here's how you handle parallel titles. This is the correct way to do that punctuation. You have in this type, in this case, an English example of a title, space, colon, space. Then you have the Italian. Giulietta is a proper name. It does not have a translation. Then you have an English one, the Italian. 
So this is how you do it, space, colon, space. Here, I want you to think for a moment. We've got a table of contents from a book that I had to pull because I looked at it, you know, the way it was, and I just wasn't sure. So I went to pull the book to see what the table of contents really was. How would you enter it on OCLC? You have this title, looks like a couple stories within it. This one, a couple stories, another. So how would you do that? Well, here's what I did. I kept that RDA, uh, kept it in caps, but I did have a subfield T for each of these because I think Department of Queer Complaints is a pretty unique title that someone might be looking for, or they might be looking for the individual components within that title. So I simply indexed every one of them. I'd like you to know that eBooks are an alternative to pulling the physical book. So you may access the table of contents in an electronic book and key them into your physical book record. You can look at the 856 fields on your physical bib record and try to access those ebook versions or access the ebook bib and look at its TOC or 856 fields. Or finally, you can just Google the title and look for an ebook version that will display the table of contents. One problem, though, you might be thinking is when you're looking at an ebook version, that material is a scanned image. And you cannot just copy and paste the text of the table of contents. So unfortunately, you do have to key it all in, but at least you have the information in front of you. When books must be pulled, and if that does happen, you may find that a number of books need to be pulled in order for you to view and key in the table of contents. I found this especially true for collections of poetry instead of short stories. Create a spreadsheet of these titles with the call numbers. It doesn't have to be fancy. I just have the title and the call number. And the stacks personnel at your institution may pull it if possible. And uh, that's a nice thing to have going for you. Um, I just needed to do this a lot more, I found, with poetry and not short stories. I think maybe it's just that, you know, there are so many poems in a book that often they simply do not even try to list the, the titles of the poems in the contents notes. There is, of course, other work that you can do on a record. You may choose to control the uncontrolled access points. I do have seven slides that show how to control access points. If you would like me to bring those up in the Q&A, please tell me in the Q&A and I could attempt to do that. But I thought it detracted too much to go into that at this point. Another thing you may choose to do is upgrade the record from earlier cataloging rules to RDA particularly if you pull the book to key in the table of contents, you might look critically at all the information in the record, improve or correct errors, and upgrade it to RDA. And frankly, if I take the time to pull a book, I do this one. I really go to town on it, make it a great record. But you do need to consider that the time and effort of extra work will slow down progress on the contents notes enhancement project overall. And another consideration is that it can require a great deal of typing to key in the table of contents and or make other changes. So keep tar carpal tunnel in mind and pace yourself. If I have a book that's a collection of poetry by multiple authors, I may only type two table of contents in, in a whole day. And that is so much typing, I stop and work on other things. Here's a record that I left for a holding institution to enhance. My, uh, my, rec my institution doesn't have it, but I figured somebody else could pull it and look at the table of contents. It's international short stories. It's three volumes. The first one is American, second English, third French. Uh, that's nice information, but certainly is an author and title. Here's RDA work that I did not do. I did enhance the contents note, 
but the person before me that uh, cataloged this work entered all these RDA analytics. I am not going to the trouble of entering these uh, for everything in the contents. You could do that if you chose. You're going to encounter some anomalies and you will wonder why was this record on Simon's spreadsheet? Well, it's not that Simon made any mistake. It's simply that the word short stories comes up. So even though this is a recording of a concert in Toronto, it has a piece titled short stories. <laughs> so this came up. And of course, you could enhance this contents note if you wanted. Other situations that you may encounter, uh, it may already have had the contents note enhanced because maybe it was done after the spreadsheet was created by Simon. In that case, there is no need to replace the record. Simply export it to the uh, network zone so it will overlay on the existing Alma Bib record. Now I'd like to mention those IZ only records that are in yellow. You can skip these on the spreadsheet because they indicate that they're held by a particular library's institution zone only. These would not overlay in the network zone in the overnight sync if you did improve them on OCLC. So why go to the work for nothing, or at least nothing to help our patrons? It will be up to personnel at that particular library to enhance their contents note if they so desire. So in this case, you can see study guides for various authors are held by Georgia Southern. Ah, control Z. Remember that all changes are saved in the spreadsheet. So if you accidentally make a mistake, immediately use control and the letter Z to undo the error. Control Z is your friend. And also, please remember the OCLC principle to do no harm. If you're in doubt, leave it alone. Or you might consult another cataloger. You could see bibliographic formats and standards. Chapters 5.1 and 5.2 are really good, I, I found, for more detail. If you can't change the record, I'm writing here to send an email to bibchange at OCLC to report the problem. But honestly, I think you might want to check with LibAnswers first and, uh, you know, a colleague that you have there or LibAnswers and see if we can resolve the situation before you would report it to OCLC. But you do have that option. And OCLC offers free webinars at this address. Uh, one of them is Best Practices for Enriching WorldCat Bibliographic Records. Uh, I attended that. It was pretty good. Recordings for past sessions are also available from the bottom of the registration page. Yeah, and that's it. I'm ready for your questions. And What's a librarian without cats? <laughs> so I put some pictures of uh, cats in my life here at the bottom. Gingy's my present cat. Just so you have something to look at during the question and answers. <laughs> Now, if you have any, I'd be glad to uh, address them. Thanks, Shelly. And uh, I do like seeing the pictures of the cat. Thank <laughs> you for adding them. If you, um, the, if the attendees have questions, go ahead and pop those into the q and I see one question um, so far. It says, how time consuming has this been for you? Well, as I said, it was my first priority, and I generally work eight hours a day. So from about mid-March through the beginning of July, I spent many hours working through the short stories. I had already started the ones for my institution, but I certainly got to the point where I was working through ones for all the institutions. That's not to say I got them all done, because sometimes, as you could see, they may need to be pulled by that institution to enter the contents. So I can't say they're all done. Uh, I'd recommend any cataloger go through that spreadsheet and look if you have the time and can enhance any of those. But, you know, it just depends on you. Maybe you only have a half hour. You know, maybe you've had a heavy duty day of original cataloging and you just can't do one more thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? At the end of the day, 
this might be a good project to work on because it really is pretty easy, but kind of on the tedious side. It's not on the brain surgery side of cataloging. So if you find a little time in your schedule and you don't want to get into something that's too difficult, this is a nice project to work on. Um, and it certainly does help our users. I found that for myself when I looked at Primo. So if you only have a little time now and then, that's great. If you're really into working electronically, uh, you could work a lot on this project. Great, thank you for that response. Are there any other questions that attendees have? Please type them into the Q&A or use the raise your hand feature. I'll give this a moment uh, to see if anyone has any more questions. I'd also like to add catalogers out there, if you've been working on this project and you have some tips that I didn't cover, you know, do please sp uh, speak up. We'd like to learn from your experience. Well, I guess seeing no additional questions or uh... Yeah, I mean, if there's anyone who wants to share experiences, we'd love to hear that too. Let me say, tweet something in the Q&A from Ann Williams. Is there a certain cataloger level in Alma that you need to have in order to do this project? I don't think so. Um, your level on uh, of cataloging level on Alma makes no difference to OCLC where you're actually doing the work. And it doesn't make any difference to your ability to access a spreadsheet. And I don't think it makes any difference to your ability to do the export. So when you really think about it, it's not Alma, it's OCLC, if you have OCLC permissions and what they are. Um, if anybody thinks I'm wrong with that answer, do chime in. My level is 30. I do have the top level. So honestly, I just never worry about it. But I don't think it would be relevant for Alma. The uh, attendee said, so it's mainly having the OCL connection set up. Uh, can you repeat that? I didn't quite catch that. And, and, you know, she's listening to your response and she said, so it's mainly having the OCLC connection set up. Yes, I use connection. Of course, I think you can also use the browser, um, but I, I just use OCLC connection myself. But there's no reason you can't use the browser if that's the method you use to access OCLC for cataloging. Ann says, thanks, Shelly, and uh, great. Thanks oh, yeah. for that. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Are there any other questions from the attendees? See, any, in the, any raise your hand? No, I think that we think that we are done. Um, and of course, Shelly can be reached at the email address that you see right there on the screen if you do have additional questions for her. And I'd be glad to talk with you on the phone, but at least contact me via email and you know, then we could arrange a time to talk on the phone and work through whatever you need to know. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, in all of this virtual, I haven't talked to people on the phone as much. It's mostly been email, but sometimes it's nice, you know, to <laughs> talk mm -hmm. to someone again. Um, oh. so th thanks for that offer. Yes, or, I, I'm rarely in the office, so you know, email's the way to reach me. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I want to thank you for joining us and doing this presentation for everyone. It's been very, uh, very insightful to get your to get your thoughts on the enhancement project. Oh, you're and very welcome. I also wanna thank the attendees for coming to this session. We appreciate your participation in this session and throughout Guggum. And as we mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, Shelly's slides will be available on the conference platform. 
and this recording will be available at a later date. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.